Hello, can you hear me? Great. Okay, so I had a lot of thoughts going through my mind just now when Moses was speaking. And just before I start, I thought it might be really interesting to think about what he said about personalization. And of course, that's what my, my, my topic is about today. But um, what's really interesting is what he said just now about trying to connect what we've done in our roundtable sessions this morning and what does that mean in terms of us connecting with our students? Are we delivering the same sort of platform? And I think what we've done today, so some of the conversations on my table was, I mentioned communication, we were collaborating together, we were doing critical thinking. One another lady said blended learning. Um, so if you just, that was really interesting because she didn't say blended learning with a particular technology. What she said is we were chatting, we were communicating, then we were going online. So we haven't reinvented the wheel, if you think about it from that perspective. I, you know, he didn't, nobody's given us a particular software today or technology or a piece of kit and said, this is how we're gonna personalize your thinking and your education or our thought process. Th that's just a thought that came to me there. You don't have to have any particular sort of gadgets or software. It's what we are doing, which we can then transfer to education. I think I can knit this a lot better at the end of it. Um, but today's topic is really about personalization and it's back to the basics of what we do in the classroom and how we can connect the dots. So, to the next slide. Before I start, a lot of people ask me, you know, I want your PowerPoint, and then when they get the PowerPoint through the, through the um, presenters, they find that they can't seem to find one, so I've stuck my photo on it so you know where it is. Um, a bit of introduction about myself, I'm the director of e-learning, like he said. Prior to this, I've um, done three, worked in three, four different schools in London, southwest of London in prep schools, and my role pretty much is to go into a school and work with IT, work as the middleman between IT, MIS, and the teachers, the SLT, the exec team. Um, but more than that, I do a lot of e-learning with staff, students, teachers, and bring the school up to scratch so that everybody's empowered to make the right decisions. And actually, we're treating our students how to work and function in 21st century classroom. So that's the kind of work I do. These are different places I've spoken at, and I just thought I'd give a bit of an introduction before we move on. Okay, so today's presentation are these five bullet points. As you can see, that's why you're here. What I've done is I've divided it up and I'll take you through it one by one. I've kind of joined the first two um, because I think they sit together quite well. So if you're looking at setting individual protocols for different learning areas that students understand and act from a personalized point of view and then building choice and lesson planning which are relevant to real life experiences, I cannot put that down to tech. I know we're all here to find something that will help fix this problem. Maybe we can personalize, personalize our lesson plans and bring really cool experiences to our students with the tech, but it's not the tech. And then I wanna say it's also not the content, yes, although it, it does work together, it's really coming back down to the basics, the pedagogy. And this is nothing new to any teacher out here. I mean, you might, I might have a few teachers here, and I, I think the one thing we learn when we, when we were getting trained is, what is your pedagogy? What are your pedagogical strategies? Why are you teaching your students and how can you differentiate their work? Bear with me, I'll, I'll try to put it all together. So if you look at pedagogy, I work, I've done a PhD in um, creating and developing a new pedagogy for young children with, with tablets and I've followed the Mishra, the TPAC model. Um, what I tend to do with most staff is I say, look, let's look at the technology. Don't use it if it's rubbish, park it, I'm not interested, but get back down to the basic. What are your pedagogical strategies? Why are you doing what you're doing? And then taking that forward, how can you improve the outcomes for your children? So again, in conversation with another candidate or delegate, today or yesterday, one of the, like, they're all kind of all blended together. Um, his question to me, or rather his, his concerns were, we're, we're hitting a mass target of students and we're finding it very difficult to differentiate. Um, and, and even though we want to personalize with all the technology we have in schools, it's really difficult. We don't know how to do this. So we have, I spent a lot of time this year and last year working on feedback and assessment in my school, which I will share with you in the next few, few slides. But coming down to personalization, it's not the tech that's going to change it. It's just, a, that technology is just an enabler, it's just a tool. And it's not even the content, although you do have to snip it when you start putting it up on technology. It's how you teach, it's how you present, and it's what you're going to do with the children to get them to lead their own learning journey. So what did I do? I sat back for three, four months and I thought about this and I thought, how can I make this, how can I touch the lives of my students where I'm actually gonna make, it, they're gonna make the change. I will help facilitate that change. And so I followed John Haiti's um, conference, and I'll, I've, got, I've referenced him again later on. 
But I found that we need to start looking to weave the technology into our pedagogy. Now, what, does, what in the world does that mean? Um, so I spent a lot of time going back to the basics. Roll back the clock, forget it, forget all this tech. I don't want to know anything about it. What have we been doing? Um, so a lot of what we do in the classrooms is delivering the content, looking at our teaching strategies, delivering in a ways that matches students' expectations, our students' learning. That's visual, that's audio, that's written, whatever it takes. Some, some children will get it just by you talking to them. Others will need to go hands-on and kinesthetic. I looked at it at, you know, we, we spent a lot of time differentiating with worksheets and books and materials. Okay, let's look at it from that perspective. And then other things like assessment, homework, feedback, metacognition. So, we were, I mean, initially when I walked into the school, we had tons of, uh, of, of tech. In fact, so much that it's confusing. But a lot of the different schools I went into, we would roll out a one-to-one -one iPad scheme or one-to-one -one tablet scheme, and that's the tech, and that tech was going to change the world. Maybe. And we did get a lot of apps in. And it was great because the apps enhanced the lesson. It added that five-minute, ten-minute ten minute motivation and engagement in the classroom. But did it really change our teaching practices? Was it really touching these five areas? Or was it just an add-on? And that's when I stepped back and I said, it's great having that spreadsheet of apps for every subject area, but we need to look at classroom management tools and how we can change that to touch the learner's outcomes. So, so I spent a lot of time with our staff and I thought about what we could do in primary and secondary sector. And I think I've got an example of each. So we looked at our teaching strategies, and a lot of teachers stand in front with a whiteboard behind them, and then they talk, or they might demonstrate, and they might get the children come to front and write and do what they need to do. And I said, well, what do we have on board here? So we looked at some classroom management apps, and we found that um, with the young children, particularly in the primary years, we introduced something called Explain Everything. It's an app. You might know about it. There is a cost associated to it. But what, we, what the teacher did is she recorded her, she was doing some mathematical computational thinking with the children. So we were just math, really simple maths, four plus two equals six. What she did is she recorded herself trying to solve the solution, the, this problem. And at the same time, she then had another 10 attached in different slides. And then she airdropped it to all the iPads in the classroom. Now there were some children who could go through it really, really quickly. And that was fine because she then had another bank of another 10 slides which she could move on with. But then there were others who needed to hear, the rep repeat what the lesson was about, and all they had to do was play the session. And then she, that, whatever she was going to teach them or what she did teach them was played back to her them. So in one way, you had some children in a group moving quite quickly, and if they, if they couldn't figure it out, it stopped, and they played it back to themselves, and they saw the ticker moving along as well. In the secondary school, we did what we call iBooks. We have our religious, religious studies in year nine. And um, luckily, this teacher is really great, and she's decided she'd pilot a iBook with us. And so we've created what we call, it was very much about the Islam, the religion of Islam at that time. Um, but the year nine students, so we dropped it onto their iPads. What we found is that they never forgot their books at school or at home. Um, they never, the teacher didn't have to print anymore. Students did exceptionally well in the exams. I cannot say that, that it, was, it was because of those books that they did well. But what I can say is that they use that as a re revision techniques. That's not to say that other students were not writing on their books. They were doing that as well. But they had this another tool for differentiation. So again, we offered them studying in a different capacity. So for those that wanted to write, fine. For those that wanted to read up on other references, fine. And then for those who worked really well with some sort of tech in their fingertips at all times, that was great too. So we were trying to differentiate as much as we could. In terms of homework and projects, um, this, is no, this shouldn't be new to you, but we obviously did the whole flip learning approach. I had a math teacher year four, absolutely amazing, and he recorded all his videos. Um, what was really interesting here was that there were some students who did not understand how to add in, the, in, 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 in a more traditional manner, like how, how me or you or anybody had learned. Um, my son came home with about four different ways of adding and dividing. There was a Russian method as well. And I had no idea what he was talking about until I actually saw these videos. Um, and his, his, his homework was to look through these videos, and then he had a few, on, a few questions after that and answer. So 
what was really great is you, it, wasn't, it wasn't pushed upon them that you have to learn it in this particular traditional manner. There are three, four different, man, uh, different routes and see which one works for you and then answer your questions. So we found that flip learning through recording videos on um, Show Me or, or just putting it up on YouTube made a big difference. Again, that's not to say that he didn't do it in the classroom. He did do all this whole work in the classroom. He showed it in a very traditional manner, but he sent it home. He got the kids to um, connect, he connected with the kids, so it became like a real life experience for them. It was very much what they do, watch videos and figure it out. But he also connected the parents with it. Um, so flip versus traditional, you know, it's kind of different where you're not just sitting there and listening. I found that I didn't get what he was doing, but when he went back to school, the bits that he didn't understand, the teacher was able to fill in the gaps. Um, and then from that point of view, those that were ready to move on, he had different sort of sets and, and, and information ready. So what is, so you know, from this point of view, we we're setting individual protocols. We were in a way trying to connect with the students. We were trying to say, let's look at Padlet, a virtual wall. You know what, we've got this um, German history project. It was German and English and French and Spanish. The whole the MFL department got together and decided we're gonna do this huge project and we're gonna put up a virtual wall. So they use Padlet. Um, where all the students from home or anywhere else could drop in answers to the questions and what they thought about some sort of, the, the celebrating a 25th anniversary of, I don't know, I can't remember, some, some, some sort of big thing. Now they couldn't have done it in school just trying to synchronize all those classes. But what they did do is they set up Padlet, they sent it out, they gave the URL to the kids, they got the kids to do the QR, uh, to scan it, and then all the work was coming in from night. It was great because by the time the next day came, there was an assembly, it was all there in front of everybody to see. Um, so from that point of view, we were able to not differentiate, but collaborate and communicate and just take that learning that step further. So what, and that's when I'd say we actually got them to understand what they were doing. That we were working in their world. It's no, it's no news to us that this is what our kids do. They run with images, they run with videos, they run with um, anything on screen. And the more you step away from it and give them more paperwork, and there's nothing wrong with the pen and paper, I use it all the time, um, the less they feel connected to us. So we're trying to connect with them and make and give them what we call real life experiences. Now the reason I've circled that bottom bit is because um, I found that while we as teachers are offering new opportunities to students and we're trying to touch their lives or teach them on different channels through either Digital Botanica or through YouTube materials or to show me. The problem was when it came to handing in homework or responding back to a project, we expected it on paper and pencil. And that's just hypocrisy. Um, and, and that was the problem. So yes, we were connecting with students and great stuff, stuff, we're doing really well and we've learned all these fantastic sort of technology. Let's run with it. But what was happening, can you please write your sums on the piece of paper and hand it to me in my book? Or can you, here's a worksheet. Uh, I'm gonna take a photo of it, I'm gonna airdrop it, but when you go home, write on that, print the worksheet out, write it and bring it back to school. So there was a bit of a contradiction going on there, and that's when I said, look guys, if you're gonna ask them to look at spatial dimensions and you want them to illustrate depth, then let them create it in Minecraft. But then ask them to explain, ask them to reflect what they're doing so that they can respond back in the manner that you're teaching or you're gonna get them to, to do a story for you, or you want them to put down a narrative, why must they have to write it down? Why can't they interview themselves? Why can't they video themselves? Why can't they offer a digital storytelling? So the problem was we, weren't, we were acting upon it, but the response we were getting back was um, one that we were enforcing upon our students rather than letting them run with the show. So giving that bit of personalization. Again, it's really important because you wanna personalize the learning outcomes, but at the same time, you want to personalize a learning journey. So let them demonstrate what they think is best. That's not to say, don't do paper at all. That's not to say that you don't have to provide all that for evidence, but allow them to express themselves in a manner that suits them too. So then coming on to the third point, marking assessment and feedback. I spend a lot of time on this, and I think there's a, there's a definite space for this with technology. It's a great enabler. Um, from a teacher point of view, you can really save in marking, and I'll demonstrate all this in a minute. It's huge in my school. We can offer alternative assessment sort of feedback in terms of voice and notes and, and writing on screen and, and then just marking anywhere in the world, wherever we are. And we give really good constructive feedback. So it's no longer, um, I'm gonna write you a big essay and tell you how great you were, but I'm gonna get straight to the point. From the student's point of view, the feedback is real time and it's really, it, there's a lot of clarity. So they don't understand, they can respond back quickly um, through, a WhatsApp, through a message and just say, you know, I don't understand, can you come back to me? And they'll do it at any time, whatever suits them as well. And they get personal feedback. 
From a parent point of view, you're in the loop. It's great. I get to see all my kids' homework. I see where they're going wrong. I see what, what they're doing. Um, I'm finally involved in their education, and it's fun, because I know what they're doing now. So what do we do? Uh, I'll just quickly go through this, but it's very much about, has anyone seen John Hattie's work here? It's fantastic research. He's got a lot of data. He bases it on, on a quantitative, quantitative data. And his top 10 tips for what works best in learning is meeting your students' expectations. So a lot of us think that learning, teaching is just delivering. But if you're meeting their expectations, they're turning off. They're, they're closing up themselves. Um, so these are the top, top 10 tips. You'll see the in between all of that, there's feedback number 10, which is really, really important. So in terms of feedback, if some of you may have heard me speak on Kahoot yesterday. Um, it's a playful learning tool. It's a lot of fun, and kids love it. It's a free web-based software. You can create your, your discussions, your surveys, your, your quizzes, etc. And you can also pick back evidence. Um, we use what we have, Socrative. Again, you must know what it is. It's a survey tool. You can create your questions. You can push it out there. You can create its homework. But again, you can quickly look at assessing your child if and when you need to. And we use Shobi. I'm going to go to Shobi. Yes, I'm going to go to Shobi. We use a lot of Shobi in our school. In the primary years, we use Seesaw. In the secondary years, we use Shobi. And we also use Microsoft OneNote, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and what you'll see here is that we've got, it's a math class happening. We've got about 20 students, and you'll see that we've also got a lot of boarders. Um, the, the, the child has done the homework, handed it, taken a photo, handed in the homework. The teachers then come back to them saying, you know, you might want to look at these points, and this is the best way to look at it. You'll see the, the markings in red. And then the student goes, I don't understand. I don't, I don't really understand what you're saying. Can you repeat that, please? Or can you clarify? She'll then send another message through. What you'll see is she can send it via camera. She can do a voice note. She can add a grade. I'm not, I'm not pushing out Shobi to you. I'm not here to publicize it, but it works. And it's like a virtual classroom. So this teacher of mine, she's on the train, and she's assessing, and she's marking. At the same time, she's offering feedback. What's really great is that the students completely get it, and they love it. So when they get their feedback or they get their homework, it's, a, it's like a WhatsApp message. You've got a notification. Can you look into this? We found students responding at 2 o'clock in the morning. You don't have to respond as teachers. Not at all, but it just gets them really engaged, and there's a really great flow of information going back and forth. Um, some and other teachers, they use OneNote. Um, I'm not here to promote, again, Microsoft Office 365, but we have that in our school. We found OneNote a really great tool. So in my school, again, we have Microsoft Office 365, we have Firefly, we have the iPads, we have um, uh, tons of tech. And that's because I, I just inherited when I came on board, not something I'd put through. But with Microsoft OneNote, you can do it again anywhere. So what she's done, she's created a classroom. She's got all the students in there. There are different folders for each child. The child sees only their work. All the homework is uploaded into this classroom. All the lesson plans are. And when the teacher's ready to just sort of make it available to the child, they lift up the deadlines and the times, the dates, and then it gets made available to the child. So again, they personalize this work. How do they personalize it? So again, they group it. So you've got some kids who are in the higher sets, some in the middle, some in the lower sets. But it's really easy because she's offering a baseline, and then she's just, um, she's just moving around as she would do in the classroom anyway. She's adding and removing as necessary. But what's really great is it's, it's real time. So we'll come back to her. She'll be able to reassess and send it back out. So these are the summer tools that really help us and have actually made a difference. What does that mean in managing a virtual classroom? It's a lot. So you know, if you're going to use all these tools and you want to start personalizing your classrooms, then maybe you need to find a platform that works for you. There is the Khan Academy, that works for him. He does a lot of videos. There's another school called Inter High in UK, which is an online school. And again, in our school, we haven't used Google Talk Docs. I think we have enough, but we have the whole iTunes environment and the Microsoft Office 360 environment. If you're a primary school, I'd say go down the whole, uh, and, and if you can, and you've got all these gadgets, I'd say go down a tablet route and use a few bits of software, such as Seesaw, Shobi, Kahoot. Shobi, maybe not so much, but Kahoot. Um, use Padlet, it's a lot of fun, use the AirDrop. As you get older, the kids tend to like the Office 365 environment, and they just find that they have the tools such as Mail, Calendar, OneDrive, and that's what I've been working on the whole day since I've been here, and yesterday, my entire show is run with this. And that's because it's free, again, and if you're an education institution, you get to acquire it and get uh, email accounts for all your kids, and it just works really well in building a workflow. 
Um, one really great tool is you've got forms, which is part of this, uh, the, the, the last one, which is very similar to SurveyMonkey. It's, it's exceptionally great because all your data is kept within your school environment rather than floating out on the internet. So again, if you're an older school and you're trying to create a workflow and something where you can start personalizing your information, you start differentiating at the same time as providing for assessment, this is one great tool. Another one is the iTunes Apple Classroom. We're a one-to-one -one iPad school. Every, student, every teacher has an iPad, years three to 11. Every child has an iPad. It's just the way it works out. Um, what we found at the Apple Classroom is, again, it's great because you're able to start a class when you wanted to. You're able to control it with the young children. You're able to divide them up into groups. So you know what, kids, you're going to be looking at this sort of project and reading. And then the other ones I'd like you to start creating, and the other ones I'd like to start producing. And then you start that flow in your classroom. So again, Apple Cla if you're going down the whole I uh, iPad route, Apple Classroom works really well with young children. Um, OK, let's watch this first. stop it there because obviously I just threw that video at you um, but it was very much the next question is what happens with the with the 21st classroom how is it going to change what's it going to look like it's a very last bullet point in the presentation and what I'm trying to tell everybody here is please don't think that the teachers are going to get replaced never ever ever will the teacher get replaced you saw in the video that the teacher was there still in front of the class with the students. Yes, the technology was integrated in the classroom, and yes, they were using it as an enabler, but the teacher is still the killer app. And I say that constantly because you're the ones who are going to make the change, you're still the catalyst, and you are still going to create the content for the students. But what we'll do is we create in bite-sized pieces so that they can understand what's required out of them. At the end of the day, only you as a teacher know where the child is falling, where the gaps are, what they know, what they don't know, and what they, how they need to progress. So eventually, what's it going to look like? I think we're going to drop all the walls in the school. I think we're going to have flexible school spaces and architecture. If you want to know about that, go to Kassan. He's, I've been talking to him about dropping, he's been talking about dropping the walls and looking at technology going into teaching. It's not, a big, it's not the technology that's going to change it. It's the pedagogy that's going to change it and how you use it to differentiate and personalize your classroom. That's what matters the most. The students will own their own learning journey. I love that. And I'll tell you why, because we now have what we call the peer-to-peer -peer teaching university in, in, um, in England. And that's just come about in the last week. You'll see it's a BBC sort of article where they've opened up this school in France where the, t the kids are teaching each other. Teachers are not teaching anymore. The kids are going to teach, and they're going to assess each other's work. We're also going to look at what we have inter intergenerational learning. I've joined up with learning, with learning with Grandma International. Free, free to look into it. And it's where you get the older people teaching the younger ones and the younger ones teaching the older ones and learning off some of the soft skills that they're missing out today. Um, but it's going to be a really different sort of environment, the 21st classroom. I think it's going to be get the spaces going, remove all the walls, and you know, let's just learn off each other. It's very much about learning. It's not about sucking in information and retaining it. So that's pretty much it. I love to end with this. You know, education doesn't change the world. Education changes the people, and people change the world. So I really hope that we can make our changes and, and really help our students and change the world as it is. Thank you. Oh.